Coming up on Windows Weekly, Paul and Mary Jo let it all out and tell us the truth about Steven Sanofsky. We all wonder who's Andy Lee's anyway, ads on Windows, and more. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Windows Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Therott and Mary Jo Foley, episode 287, recorded November 15th, 2012, group therapy session. Windows Weekly is brought to you by Go to My PC from Citrix. Go to My PC connects you directly to your office Mac or PC from any other computer or from your iPhone or iPad too. Sign up for a 30 day free trial today at gotomypc.com. Use a promo code Windows. And by Ford, featuring available sync. Now you can control your media player with simple voice commands. Enjoy your drive while you easily search and listen to your favorite songs. Check it out on the 2012 Ford Focus and at Ford.com slash technology. And by Audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, go to Audible.com slash Windows. And get a copy of Brandon Sanderson's Legion absolutely free at Audible.com slash Sanderson. It's time for Windows Weekly. This is the show where we uh, take a look deep into Microsoft and see what's going on. And, you know, this week... A really quiet week in Microsoft news, but uh, you might have noticed that Leo Laporte is not here yet. I believe he'll be back next episode, but right now you're stuck with me. I'm Aya Zaktar, but thankfully, we've got the experts when it comes to Microsoft and Windows, and we'll be talking a bit about eh, Steven Sanofsky today. We've got Paul Thorat hanging around to my right. Uh, he was originally my left, which was crazy. It was a wild thing. I know. If you watch live weird. when we record on, on Thursdays at 11 o'clock Pacific, you'd know that we had some crazy times before. But, Paul, how's it going? You know, it, this has been kind of an interesting week. So I guess I'm doing okay. Just doing okay. That's good. I think you're you're hanging in there. Mary Jo, it's your birthday. Happy birthday to you. They've given you, Microsoft's given you a fantastic gift this week of all kinds of news. How are you? <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. It has been a great week to have a birthday. Well, that's fantastic. Let's talk about the biggest news of the week. I'm looking at the lineup because I don't make the lineup. It says here, biggest news of the week is Black Ops 2. Woohoo! Is that what you've been doing with your time, Paul? <laughs> Just putting yourself wait, wait, in we're losing Mary Jo. Mary um, Jo's out. She's she <laughs> killed her. It's beer. I've had, Mary to, jo, I've beer. had to split my time. Mary I've had jo. to split my time is the way I would say it. Okay, so <laughs> obviously we're, we're kidding. Uh, there was this slightly monstrous change at Microsoft. I believe it was Monday. The news that Steven Sanofsky, the, the head of Windows and Windows Live, stepped down and a series of emails were released. Steve, uh, Steve Palmer's emails, uh, Sanofsky's emails, a whole bunch of things going on. Where do we even begin to start with this story? Who wants to take the, the lead on this one? Oh, this one's I, all right. I, I want to tell the story of how we both found out about this. <laughs> Wait a minute. Are you going to tell it? You're going to tell I the am. story okay. about how you're... Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Should I tell that story? <laughs> Go, yeah, please. I, I, I want to... I just want to make sure it's okay. Yeah. Is it safe for work? So, um, on Monday night uh, of this week, I was sitting down to dinner and my phone rang and someone from Microsoft called me and said, you should check your email right now because there's some big news. So, I quickly went, checked my email and I saw a note about Steven Sanofsky um, stepping down and... And Microsoft promoting Julie Larson Green to be the new head of Windows Engineering. So the first thing I did after I screamed in my apartment a few times, ran around like a nut. And we'll talk about why I did that in, in a bit on the show. Uh, I immediately thought to call Paul Thorat. So I called Paul and he was in his car when I called him. But I was so incoherent about what had just happened. I just started babbling. And uh, Paul okay, was trying uh, to get that, me to calm down. First of all, that is not even close to what happened. Come on, you were, scre- you were screaming like you were being attacked. And the only <laughs> thing I could think of was like, like, oh, my God, something horrible is happening to Mary Jo. I got to call 911 or something. I almost crashed my car. <laughs> she scared the crap out of me. Now, but that's I because was, of a delivery or the almost, news? I almost hit a telephone pole. This is because of the delivery, though, not the news itself. Because I picked up, I'm like, hello? And she's like, <laughs> 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 and I was like you know, the car's like, <laughs> you know, so, oh I mean, I... 
<laughs> it, was, it was really funny. Mary Jo is not usually very demonstrative, I think is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> so Fair it enough. was it was interesting. So that's how so is that Paul, that's how you found out it was via a phone call. Mary Jo found out from a, a phone call of her own. Could you give us any details exactly what that person said, <laughs> apart from check your email cryptically? Or was there or was there more to it? Was there any cackling? Did there sound like there was <laughs> confetti being poured or champagne being popped or what was going on? Right, no, right, it, right. It, no, it, I think I should explain why why I was gleeful <laughs> yes, please, because please <laughs> I, I then then the next thing I did was I tweeted Stephen Sanofsky is stepping down as as the head of Windows at Microsoft and I hashtagged it yay, um, which got me in, in trouble with some people and some people love that. But the reason the reason I was ex- excited about this is um, as I've said on Windows Weekly before, ever since um, Sanofsky became the head of Windows, I've been pretty much blacklisted and uh, been treated as someone who shouldn't be talked to, who should not be allowed to ask questions. Um, I did get to go to things like build and all, but I was pretty much cast to the side and I never totally understood why the the reason I kept hearing when I asked, why am I being treated this way was that um, Sanofsky didn't really believe that news the way I wrote it was a function that was worthwhile Um, that he felt that Microsoft should disseminate information and the press should take it and that's how it should be done. And that's pretty much why I was put on the curb. So for me, I I don't know if this is going to change my relationship with the Windows client team or not. It may not. Um, But at least I have hope now that possibly I might be able to at least get access. Right. It couldn't get any worse. Good good, good way of putting it. So wait a second. So if, if nothing changes, you'll know it's not Steve? (laughs) <laughs> no, 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 no. If nothing changes, it means that the people who are in charge have kind of followed through on his vision for the way things should be done. Well, do you think people are going to be following what Sanofsky wanted from now on? Or they be thinking, what, what would Stephen want? Do we want to write 8,000 word blog posts? Or are they going to be like, okay, he's gone. We're going to do something, I don't know, a little different. Yeah, it, that's going to be interesting to see, right? Um, because the people who are now in charge of the Windows division are people who worked very closely with him. And the one who's in charge of Windows engineering, who is Julie Larson Green, has been working with Stephen and for Stephen since he was on office. So for a, quite a number of years, you know, so yeah. a, a lot of people are saying, do you expect it to be any different? You know, she also is part of his whole strategy and ascribes to his vision. And maybe things are just going to continue the way they are. So we don't know. For, for a fact, we don't. I, I mean, I don't, I don't know Julie Larson Green personally, but if you look her bio up, I mean, one of the things that becomes very clear is that she is where she is because of Stephen Sanofsky. So he plucked her out of some crowd somehow and decided she was going to be the, you know, lieutenant and the second in command or whatever. And now she's running the show, sort of, although as we have in the notes somewhere, she was not made the president of the Windows and Windows Live division, which was Stephen Sanofsky's job. So it's possible there'll be some further management shakeup to come. So we'll see. But, um, you know, the one, I, I, again, I don't know her and I don't mean this. I, I've, I've heard things about her from people at Microsoft, some of my sources. But the one thing I would say that's negative about all this is that they have not put a different team in charge. They have basically you know, moved him out and moved the second in command in. So, in, you know, I, I suppose part of the fear could be that it would be the same thing all over again. Yeah. I think in part they couldn't do too much to disrupt the team at this point, though, because as we yep. know, Windows 8 has just launched. It launched on October 26th. So the, I think one of the worst things they could do right now is like completely shake up the whole team when things are just starting in terms of a marketing and sales and deployment um, standpoint. So I think they probably, they being the powers at Microsoft who made this decision, uh, the board, Steve Ballmer, whoever actually finally made this decision, um, they wanted to shake things up a bit, but not too much so that it it would be completely disruptive and, and hurt the potential for the whole launch. Okay. So of course, everybody on Twitter was making jokes. Why must Microsoft always copy Apple? Based on Sanofsky's departure, his departure. It is, but it is stunningly similar, isn't it? I mean, it really is. Because they're um, comparing it to what's Forstall being kicked out for iOS well, and his Forstall maps was a guy who, well, because everyone uh, would give a lot of the credit for iOS to Scott Forstall. And yet the stories that come out about him after his ouster is that the guy was a jerk. He didn't get along well with others. He, you know, was very divisive. 
These are exactly the same things you hear about Steven Sanofsky. And he's one of those people where uh, I think people outside the company, I've heard this from a lot of people, said, oh, this is a shame. I thought he was going to be CEO. He was going to be the next guy, just like Scott Vorsal was going to be at Apple. And uh, what you hear from the people inside the company is like, uh, actually, this couldn't have been better. I mean, th this guy was so hated by so many people because of his extremely divisive ways. And I think that's the story that we're only now starting to see. We're starting to hear those stories from people inside of Microsoft. We have a few I think we can share. Um, we have others that we can't share simply because uh, it would just give away, you know, maybe who told the story and it's a little too sensitive. But um, for many years now, I've been hearing these stories. And I have to contrast, as I always do, the Stephen Sanofsky regime with the, one, with the one that came before it, you know, and uh, the differences in style and how I've talked a lot about how there should be a happy medium between the very laissez-faire uh, kind of attitude of someone like uh, Jim Alchin and the very transparent nature of Trim Jim Alchin and then the almost, uh, you know, Soviet Union-like non-transparency of Stephen Sanofsky that, you know, maybe hopefully going forward we can have something that's, um, you know, somewhere in the middle of those two. Weren't there stories everywhere about both of these people being absolute jerks and divisive mm -hmm. before they were ousted? Pretty sure I saw a bunch of a bunch of profiles on Sanofsky saying the amount of trouble he's caused in, in Microsoft well, and for Farstall. So I, okay, yeah, that, I, I, I can't. Okay, I'm sorry. Good. No, I was going to say. So th this is an interesting story too about um, you know you always can figure out things in hindsight, right? And I I was kind of not tipped off, but like kind of had a premonition something was coming when I read Jay Green from CNET's profile about Stephen Sanofsky, which came out right before the Windows launch. And in that profile, there was a, a little uh, bit of color about how Balmer and Sanofsky were not agreeing. And I, I actually went to Jay and I'm like, wow, this is like totally opposite of what I keep hearing is the case. I keep hearing Balmer is just doing whatever Sanofsky wants. And Jay said to me, things are changing and that's not the case anymore. And you should look into that more. Uh, so I think I think there were things happening before the, before Windows 8 launched and before it was completely finished, I think Balmer probably said, you know, I can't disrupt the team right now. This is like really important. We got to get Windows 8 out there. It has to ship. It has to be looking like we have a united front. And once that happened and it was time for Microsoft to start talking about what's going to happen with the next version of Windows and who's going to lead that team, I think it was the perfect time for Balmer to decide, hey, enough is enough. I've had too many complaints from inside the company, outside the company, wherever all these were coming from, and I have to take action. Is a profile, is a, is a in-depth profile basically like the Madden curse? If somebody's is profiled, they're going to get kicked out? <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> this is yep. very terrifying jo for executives everywhere. Yep. <laughs> um, you know, uh, Mary Jo and I have uh, personal bad experiences with Sanofsky, but getting the personal out of it, I think the thing I would like to drive home for people is that what he did to us is symptomatic of what he did to many, many people. And... These are people inside of Microsoft, in the people outside of Microsoft. There are numerous examples of people who left the Windows team because they couldn't stand being around this person and people who left the company because this guy was so vindictive and prevented them from getting stuff done. We've watched the, the Windows server team become absolutely subservient to Windows client over the past several years, which has been very alarming. And, and, it's, and, and I've, I've had to personally deal with people on the PR side who said, I don't like what's happening here. I don't agree with it. I, I can't explain it. I, I just can tell you that this is coming from a pie and they have decided that you're on the outs and I don't get it, you know, because any normal person wouldn't get that. And there's no doubt that he was just doing this to everybody. You're not everybody, but almost everybody, you know, everyone that wasn't part of the core team. And, uh, you know, you can look at, I think we've talked about this on this podcast a lot, this one of the bizarre aspects of the Windows team as it is today is this complete rejection of any technology that wasn't invented by them. You know, that they will just re-implement things in their own way, which I, I believe is actually the a genesis of the term reimagine there, rather than use technology from a, a, elsewhere in the company or technology that came from before they were running Windows. They, they were hell-bent on replacing everything in Windows, even to the tune of renaming and rejiggering with the file system and getting rid of the name NTFS. You know, because it was NT and that was the old stuff and that was Alchin and we can't, you know, we can't have any part of that. And um, it's just, it's alarming and it's it's one of those things, you know, when the Jay Green piece, uh, uh, Jay Green, right, from CNET? Right. Is that the right name? I don't want to get his yes. name wrong. Um, when that piece right. came out, I, I got emails 
from readers who were like, what is, what is this hit job? I mean, you know, Sanofsky's really taken windows to new heights and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, you have no idea what this guy is like. This, this is the tip of the iceberg. There, is gonna, there are going to be hundreds and hundreds of stories about this guy now that this has happened. And a collective sigh of relief inside and outside of Microsoft from people who were um, just gone after in very aggressive ways. I mean, he, he went after me in ways that were harmful to me professionally on purpose out of some petty, childish thing that I'll never understand because I'm actually an adult and I don't, under, I just don't get it. I just don't get this kind of behavior. I've never witnessed anything like this uh, before. I suppose part of it is um, kind of Steve Jobs-like, although as we can discuss later, I mean, I don't, th I actually think the differences between him and Steve Jobs are, are greater than the similarities, but um it's one of those kind of weird petulant things that's hard to, it's hard to, it sounds insane as you say it, but now that he's gone, I feel like we should say it. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, there's a lot to talk about. I mean, the other thing, Paul, Paul and I have talked about this and, you know, it, it's, it's kind of a weird thing when you're a journalist covering a technology and a company as closely as we both do Microsoft and Windows and not yeah. to let your personal vendetta or anger or the fact that you're blacklisted affect the way you write about the product. I mean, that's, it's a challenge because, you know, I, I, I've been very vocal in what I like and don't like about um, Windows 8. Um, but I, it, I tried to never let the fact that I was being held out and kept aside affect my coverage. I, I was saying what I had heard from people I was talking to and what I believed myself in using the products. And you know, it, yep. it, that's really hard to do that, but you have to do that if you're trying to be a professional. And so, you know, I, I feel somewhat bad when I tweeted the yay thing, but I also was just so relieved and, and oh. just hoping that I, I was going to have another chance at, at getting more access again. The, the problem with it was that the, a lot of the people who saw that didn't understand where it was coming from, you know? Right. Uh, because on the outside, I, the, the people who don't know this man, the people who don't know what's going on but inside the company and then with people like us as well, uh, assume that this guy is some kind of a savior or something, that he did this wonderful thing for Windows. I mean, I've actually, uh, completely outside of my feelings for Steven Sanofsky or whatever, and his just crazy hatred of, <laughs> like, the outside world, I, the one thing I can say is, you know, Windows 7 was uh, clearly a very competent release, but, um, you know, fixing Windows Vista was not hard. It's not hard to look at something like Windows Vista and say, this is what needs to be done. Um, it's the next step that's the trick, you know, where, where you go from there. And we can look at where they went from there. And I think, you know, I, I, I like Windows 8, but it's hard to describe this in ways that just don't sound nuts because it's this weird Frankenstein OS that melds like mobile and desktop. And it's, it, there's no doubt that anyone else tasked with creating the successor to Windows 8 and plotting a path into the mobile world from Microsoft would never have come up with this. There's no doubt about this. Never would have come up with this. And, you know, we can debate strategies and uh, all the different ways of doing things. But, I mean, we're, we're in a weird place now because I don't mean to say we're stuck with it. I actually, I, I like Windows 8, as weird as it is. But they, this, they've, as a company and as, as sort of a product strategy, have gone down this path. And I, I, the one thing, I, one of the many things I think we need to communicate here is uh, we, I don't believe that either Mary Jo or I see any way out of this. We're not going back to, like, a desktop OS. We're not going to have, like, a Windows 9 that looks like Windows 7 and then, you know, maybe they do this other thing. I just don't see any way they can step back from this, that they've, they've, they're going down this path. And the path is probably heading toward we're going to get rid of the desktop. And now it's kind of one of those hell or high water type things. I mean, we've, we've just, you know, we're just there. That's where we're going. Yeah, I think, I think that's a, a really important thing to bring up because since this has happened just a few days ago, I've seen people tweeting and emailing me saying, okay, now that Steven is gone, I guess that means Silverlight's coming back, right? Or here comes the start <laughs> button again. Yeah. We're going to get the start button back. No, I, I really don't think any of these things are going to happen because I think the path has been set and the direction's been set. Um, you know, even uh, I've seen people saying, okay, so that maybe, you know, this is going to change the whole course. And you guys have been talking about Blue being this next version and maybe that's not going to happen now. Um, I think all the things that we have said are going to happen, you know, Blue coming next year being an update to Windows 8, then followed by Windows 9, maybe by 2014. I think those are all still going to happen. And uh oh 
That was a dramatic pause. But while, <laughs> yeah, exactly. while, while that's Don't happening, we might, might as well take a break right there because we're going to dive more what? into Steven Sonofsky. Oh, sorry, Mary Jo, you just, Mary Jo is back, but she disappeared. You uh, you froze for a second. I disappeared. Froze. There was, it was yes. the Microsoft uh, brass up top at Skype going, wait a second. Cut her off for a second. <laughs> just, <laughs> just hey, kidding. we own Skype, don't we? Kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm not saying that that actually happened. It's just a joke. Uh, but let's take a quick break and uh, let's let's summon Leo Laporte, who I can see in his office in a wild color shirt. He has a message. He's waving his arms frantically trying to get to me. What does what he have to say, sir? Hey, Paul. Hey, Mary Jo. Don't mind me. I'm just going to step in here for a moment via go to my PC. I wish, actually, <laughs> that'd be cool. I wish I'd thought of this. I could have I could have done this commercial via go to my PC. What was I thinking? Just put the webcam up and send it to you. Ah, well, there you go. Go to my PC. It, I did before I left. I absolutely put go to my PC on my office computer, Mac or PC. And then wherever I go via my iPad, my uh, Nexus 7, my iPhone even, I can access my office computer. I can do everything I could do at work, send and receive email, access any network resource, run any program. It even works on an iPad mini. That is so cool to be on the iPad mini and to be accessing my office computer, Windows or Mac, and doing all the work I'd need to do. You know, one of the things I'm doing on my trip is giving uh, presentations, and inevitably I'll, I'll, I'll have left something on the computer, a slide, a graphic, some data that I wanted. You used to be able to call up, say, would you email me that? Not anymore. Go to my PC. I fire it up. The apps are free on, on all the more mobile platforms, and uh, I'm on my computer. And I can do anything I can do. I can get those files. It is a truly amazing product. And, of course, because it's from Citrix, it's secure, 128-bit SSL. It's fast, easily the fastest remote access out there. It's just effective. Windows, Mac, iPad, iPhone, Android. Go to my PC is a great way to do remote access. Take a, take a Friday's off or travel and get the job done never go without your files your programs your email again it is so great if you're about to take a trip like i am visit go to my pc.com click the orange try it free button and use our promo code windows to get it for 30 days free go to my pc.com try it free button promo code windows you're gonna love it back to you guys more windows weekly now well thanks leo for that message now mary joe what were you what were you saying before you were so rudely interrupted by the internet gods? <laughs> Sorry. And also, as I just told Paul, there are the brick repointers are right outside my window again. So if you guys lose me, I'll be back. Okay. <laughs> They're banging, hammering, drilling right out, right literally a few feet from me. So sorry. Hmm. Uh, I was saying... Do the workers um, have that, little Windows flags on their shirts? You should be careful. <laughs> Microsoft Ninjas, like look out. It's like a scene from one of those action movies, you know. <laughs> well, that's not our window repointer, <laughs> you know. Oh, <laughs> that's the end of that. Yay! <laughs> a different yay. <laughs> no, I was saying um, that a lot of people think the course now may change of what's coming for Windows. You know that things are going to go back to the way they were, or that Microsoft's going to do this huge 180 turn because of the change in leadership. And I don't think that's going to happen uh, because I think the path has been pretty much already set. And they're already following along the road to blue and then to Windows Windows 9. So, uh, you know, there, there will be changes. You know, the, the official corporate word is the reason that this all happened was because Microsoft is going to try to be more collaborative across divisions going forward and that they didn't believe Sanofsky was the most collaborative person. Um, and that they ex that we should expect to see more collaboration among the different divisions instead of the divisions fighting each other all the time and and. You know, doing things like perhaps, you know, not accepting the Windows phone uh, operating system for a tablet. I mean, I'm, I'm just using that as a total hypothetical example. I'm not saying that's now going to happen. But, uh, you know, I, I think we, you should expect some strategy kinds of changes and probably a reorg um, in the not too distant future where there'll be some shaking up and maybe some more things happening cross divisionally that haven't happened in the past. But I don't think people should expect technologies that they wanted to see continue forward, uh, go forward, just because of this happening this week. Somebody in the chat room is saying Microsoft's approach apparently be, is we dug our graves, so we might as well use them. Is that what, what, how you guys see this with Windows 8? I mean, <laughs> they've gone all in with this, whether they like Sanofsky or not. There must be somebody up top who's like, well, yes, this tile thing's the way to go, even with that jerk over there. We still think this is the future. Yeah. But, I mean, is, well, is, are they digging their graves, is it, or is this something that's overblown? 
Uh, I mean, I'm not, I'm pretty sure that wasn't the title of the memo, but yeah, I mean, they clearly had some collective decision that this was the right way to go. I mean, you got to remember uh, for all of the awful stuff that we're talking about here, I mean, you know, Windows 8 does set up Windows for the future. It does set up this kind of mobile future. I, there are real strategy reasons for commingling the code because I think that Microsoft's other non-Windows platforms have not necessarily done so well in the past. And this is one way to get that thing out there in the world and that the future as we see it is probably the Metro stuff, not the desktop, that eventually the desktop stuff would be phased out. And so, you know, this is part of a much wider strategy at Microsoft from that involves moving from traditionally delivered software, you know, on disk and, and locally installed to uh, services. You know, uh, Office is being delivered as a service this time around. Uh, Windows Azure rather than on-premises versions of Windows Server and, uh, you know, Exchange up in Office 365 rather than in your own company and so forth. So um, this is part of that broader move. And I think it makes sense, at least generally and thematically. But um I don't see, you know, anyone who thinks like, oh, this means the start button is coming back or, you know, now we're going to be able to boot to the desktop. I, I, I don't really, I, I don't think those people are thinking about this the right way. Clearly, there's been a collective decision at Microsoft that this is the right direction. They just decided that maybe he wasn't the right guy to get him there. You can see different product SKUs for Windows, Windows Desktop, Windows Tablet, things like you actually would give you the desktop back as default. It, the back of the Are you XP suggesting days, fragmentation? Is that what I just heard? I'm just saying a, a back to a, the Microsoft root of XP where we had Tablet yeah. Edition, Media Center Edition, uh, Ultimate Edition, or whatever else they had. There was like 12 different versions. No, I know. I but know. it really well, hurts. This, this stuff's hard because part of me wants to and does applaud Microsoft for taking very aggressive steps, even if I may disagree with some of the exact uh, strategies and so forth. I mean, um, Microsoft historically has always done the backwards compatibility thing. You know, when Microsoft phases in the new start menu in Windows XP, they offer a way to go back to the old one for the people like the one from Windows 2000. You know, they always do that kind of thing. And so with Windows 8, for the first time, I mean, they drew a hard line in the sand. And that was very much, I think, a Sanofsky strategy. Like, this is a decision. We're, we're not going to allow that kind of backwards mode. We want people to just have to use this and get used to it. Uh, a very aggressive stance, not something that they usually do. So, uh, you know, again, I I understand, I get it, but I I do sort of applaud that aspect of it because I, I think it's going to be a hard, it would be a hard sell otherwise. I think if they, if they made this optional, if they made this something you could skip, if they made this something you would just bought in a special SKU, uh, no one would be using it, no one. No one. I think, I think something else to um, bring up too, because this is a question I think Paul's gotten a lot this week, and I have too. Is uh, people who are saying, you know, the real reason that Microsoft and Sanofsky parted ways is because Windows Eight has been a flop. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm like, okay, well, we we don't really have much data on Windows Eight sales so far. We have the four million figure, four million upgrades in the first three days. Um, we also don't have any Surface numbers yet. Um, you know whether. Bomber was quoted out of context or not out of context about it selling moderately or however you want to present that. That's fine. But I, I really strongly do not believe there has been enough time and enough um, time for the product to be out in the channel for Microsoft to have said, okay, flop, he's out. I, I just don't see this as a factor at all. And it's amazing how many times that's being presented as fact. Like, oh, they, it's, it's off to no. such a bad start. They get rid of the guy. There's no, there's no way. There's no way. No. Didn't Microsoft tout like 4 million licenses were sold yeah. like in the first four days for Windows yeah, 8? And it's, yeah, and it's got to be at least 4.1 million by now, so I don't really see what the problem is there. <laughs> um, no, I, I look, you, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to look at Windows 8 coming down the pike and say this is not going to be a huge yeah. thing in, the, in businesses, for example, right? That Most of which are still in some process of upgrading to Windows 7. So yeah. obviously, Windows 8 will go out on new PCs just like every version of Windows before it. I mean, uh, people talk about what a disaster Windows Vista was, but the truth is they sold, you know, uh, a couple hundred million copies of that thing every year during its life cycle. And so Windows 8 certainly will sell at least that. I don't, I don't see any um, ne net negative effect on PC sales because of Windows 8. Um, there are certainly questions around the devices and which device types make the most sense. That's kind of a weird fragmentation in the market where we have really low-end ARM devices on one side that run sort of Windows 8. We have really high-end PCs like we've always had. And now we have this new generation of Clovertrail PCs, which kind of split the difference and offer some of the benefits of ARM with all of the compatibility benefits of uh, 
the normal x86 stuff, but are themselves constrained in some other ways. And so I, there's a lot of questions around that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, again, we're, this is... This is Microsoft fitting uh, what would normally be a very long and slow transition into a very short period of time. I mean, I, um, I, I just think we give them that. I, 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 I'm, to me, that's, it's still the right thing to do um, generally. So I don't think it has anything to do with Windows 8. Yeah. And, There's and so much else fair, to complain about with it. <laughs> there is. <laughs> I was going to say, to be fair, because we've just been kind of slamming everything about Steven Sanofsky here, um, I've also gotten some mail from people who work in the Windows division this week, um, or at least say they do, because they're writing under fake names because they don't feel like they can use their real names. Um, they who, But the way they're talking, I do believe they work for the Windows division. Uh, and they actually are saying, you guys are being pretty hard on him because there was a lot of good things he did too in terms of fixing oh. um, organizationally things that were broken inside Windows, getting us to ship on time, making it more reliable when windows releases came out that that he lived up to all the things you know that his his kind of mo was he gets the trains running on time and yes he did oh, and so he was mussolini <laughs> <laughs> you know hey, congratulations Come on, i'm trying to be know. fair i'm trying to be fair here no, I, no let's not do that that's terrible but I, <laughs> no i i um i i would point you to to both to the Letter from Microsoft CEO Steve Ballmer. I'm gonna. I'm looking at it now, just to make sure I get this right. But he he basically implicitly talks about how this guy did not work in an integrated fashion with other parts of the company, and talked about the need for that to change. I mean, I find that to be really interesting. You know, that if you look at the, you know, I'm grateful for the many years of work that Stephen has contributed to this company. I mean, what a generic thing to say about someone who led the office division for many years and then the Windows division. I mean, for all of the things that you could say about the guy who did that stuff, who supposedly rescued Windows and, uh, you know, it's like the many years of work. You know, you were here. Thank you for being here at Microsoft. Well, you know, it was like, obviously, the, it was obviously the, one of the word templates for the let go employee thing, wasn't it? Yeah, <laughs> right. It looks like you're trying to get rid of an employee. Would you like some help? <laughs> yeah, Flippy. I mean, it, it really, it, it just, it's, it's, it's damning with faint praise, you know, and uh, I think it's important to read between the lines a little bit on that stuff because it's it's frankly not that difficult. I mean, I'm, this is, we're not like code breakers or anything. I mean, it's right there. You can read it yourself. I find that to be, um, I, I just find that to be very telling. Can we talk a little bit about Sanofsky's public image? I mean, the thing is, he wrote a ton of blog posts on the Building Windows 8 blog. He came to the forefront with all of these presentations. I don't think, I mean, I, I can't remember another time mm -hmm. where a Microsoft executive was getting on stage as much as somebody like this because... Almost like a megalomaniac. Uh, you, could, you could say that. But it looked like he was very concerned with the way he was perceived to the point where he's even commenting on other people's blogs a uh, former yeah. Microsoft engineer, I believe his name is like Hal Berndinson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Berenson. Thank you, yeah. Berenson. Megalomaniac. So, <laughs> so wait, Paul, you think this I, this this is the uh, here's, machinations here's the of a megalomaniac? Here's a fact: um, he was the only one that posted to that blog. He, he was everything went through him. Everything, you know, it, it, he was the ultimate micromanager. There's no, there's no, there's just no doubt about this. He just was that guy. And then he would go out. You know, I, he used to write me and complain about stuff or comment on stuff. And, and I remember having this discussion with others where I would say, don't you have a Windows release to put out? I mean, what, how do you possibly have time to do this, you know, to, to oversee everything that's going on out in the world with regards to your product? You know, um, I, I always found that to be very bizarre. Um, and, you know, one of the odd aspects of him. So if you imagine you're on the Windows team, right? So you have to deal with this guy. Obviously, he's the boss. And so when he sends you an email and you're on the Windows team, oh my God, you have to answer that thing and you have to respond to every single point that he makes. The problem with him is it doesn't stop there. You could write him back and say, you know what? You're right about everything. I apologize. He will write you again and he will write an even longer email. And now, now you really have to deal with this thing. Okay, so that's you're in the Windows division. Now imagine you're not in the Windows division and he still writes you about this stuff. Because maybe there was some perceived slight and something that you wrote in your own blog somewhere else at Microsoft or internally in an email thread or whatever it was. And now you have to deal with Steven Sanofsky. Maybe you go back to your boss or somebody in your own chain of command and you say, what's going on with this guy? What is this? Like, and th their response is, that's Steven Sanofsky. You need to deal with this. 
But as with as is the case with the guy in the Windows division, answering an email does not put an end to the story. It goes on and on and on. And it becomes this infinite loop of you having to respond to everything that he writes. Now, imagine you're a guy like me. I don't work for Microsoft. He would do this to me. Incredibly long emails. I'd respond to his points. Incredibly long responses. It's like, don't you have something to do? Like, what? Why? how is this possible? You know, that you have time to write this stuff. It's crazy. And so, you know, those blog posts uh, that he wrote on the uh, Building Windows 8 blog, the one, you know, the parts that he wrote, and, and, and of course, everyone starts aping his style. You get these 3,800, 7,000 word, whatever, long Byzantine biblical posts about, I don't know, electrical currents or whatever the hell they were writing about. You, you could write that stuff so much more concisely than they did. And it, it was just his style. He would beat everything to death. And that is the ultimate example of a micromanager or, or a megalomaniac. He, he had to have the last word on everything. Not just the last word. He had to have every word on everything. Some every folks, word. Some folks but in the chat know, room. Are, oh, go ahead, Mary Jo. I, I was going to say, you know, but back to the Jobs versus Sanofsky comparison. I mean, Jobs also was a complete um, micromanager, right? And that seemed to be accepted more in Apple that he was that way. And I, yes, he was the CEO instead of the person who just ran a single but very important division in the company. But it's interesting to see that that characteristic in Jobs was not a problem, uh, at least not a public problem, like it is with Sanofsky. It, it feels very different. And I've been thinking a lot about that. Like, why is that different? And part of the reason I think is, is market share. I mean, at, at Steve Jobs, I forget the exact wording of the quote, but he said, you know, you can't leave product decisions up to customers. We have to tell them what they want, something along those lines. And I think, I think with Sanofsky, this was also his goal that he, we know best. We don't need all these testers giving us a lot of feedback. We'll let them test, but we're not going to really take much of their feedback. We've already decided this is how the product is going to be. Um, yep. And I think that worked when you have like Apple does, you know, 7% of the market share on PCs. Uh, it doesn't work as well when you have 1.2 billion users and 90% of the market that Microsoft does. That's just uh, one difference, perhaps, um, that I can think yeah. of. That was actually a very early indication on the Windows side when uh, they had a very, uh, I don't want to call it a rich tradition, but they had a very well-established uh, system of beta testers, people who felt involved. They would get involved early. They would give them builds. They'd get feedback. They would change the product based on what these people uh, provided. Um, these people all got shut out. It started with Windows 7 when, when Sanofsky took over. And I got many, many email complaints from people who were saying, what's going on here? We used to be part of the process. They don't care anymore. And they would just release these products and say, yeah, give us some feedback and uh, we'll fix some bugs. And that was basically it. And they, they um, collectively as a group uh, did not like our response to that because we would complain about it. And they, then they would start writing long blog posts about how feedback was really important to them. And your feedback, it's like when you call. You know, your call is important to us, which explains why you're going to be on hold for 37 minutes. You know, it's, it's, your call is not important to us. And your feedback is, was not important to them. And, that, and that's just the truth. We, we have been complaining about that for years. I mean, that, there's a typical example. Yeah, but taking all that feedback in the first place had the different SKUs of XP. We had like 10 versions of that. And then mm -hmm. we had Vista, the mess that was that. And there was a ton of feedback. No feedback leads to seven, which like fixed this mess. And then eight. Anyone could have fixed seven. That, anyone. Any, anyone could have fixed seven. Well, then seven. it wasn't anyone in charge of, uh, Vista, of, of right. uh, Vista. And anyone wasn't there <laughs> after that. You know what? I, Vista, okay. I, I'm not going to, I don't want to go through this in, in too much depth. V, Vista is a little unfair because obviously Microsoft was shooting for the stars with the Longhorn, wasn't able to make it come together. Um, they they bit off more they can chew. It's the simplest thing possible to say. You know, Vista, people talk about, oh, it took them six, six years. You know, Windows Vista, as we know it, took two years to create. It was a very short product cycle, actually. They completely reset that product. Um, it, it's not the th the horrible thing that everyone says it is. I mean, they, they had to get it out. They were behind. I mean, so um, they fixed the, the performance issues very quickly. They fixed the uh, compatibility issues very quickly. But what they had done under the covers, I think, is very important and set the stage for Windows 7. Windows 7 would never have been possible without Vista because they componentized the OS. Uh, they created an all-new foundation for the OS and so forth. So I get it. You know, everyone, everyone likes to make fun of Windows Vista. But honestly, it was... Um, you know, it was, just, it was just a bad experience all around, obviously, but it was, it was what happened. I mean, like I said, anyone could have, anyone could have taken Vista and made Vista 2.0. I mean, 
Um, they had the Mojave Project thing where people were looking at Windows Vista and thought it was awesome and thought it was better than anything they'd ever seen before. It was the same thing. Um, a lot of Vista was just perception. Hmm. perception. I know. I, I'm um, not defending either one. I really I mean, wait until I wait until I launch into my Windows Millennium Edition defense because I've got <laughs> one for that too, and it's true because a lot no a lot of people don't understand. They forget. That, you know, some of the stuff that was in there that actually was very important for Windows that debuted in that version of the OS. I mean, so, you know, I, I hear you, but <laughs> the, <laughs> it's easy to make fun of something that no one is actually using anymore and pretend that was a big pile of shit. But a lot of people actually used it and it was fine. And so, sorry, but that's just the way it is. Should we delve more into Sanofsky or, or are, we, are we free of Sanofsky at this point, as is Microsoft? No, we're not done. We're, we're not, not done, done with, with Microsoft. We're not done with uh, we're Sanofsky. We're never going to be done. Okay, so this is like, <laughs> well, there he is. If you're watching the video, he looks triumphant. There's Steven Sanofsky with his arms spread wide open, explaining how many people he's making very unhappy by being on stage. <laughs> Actually, let me tell you the first time I met Steven Sanofsky, right? This, this sets the stage, for I think, for our relationship which was um, in the build-up to what became Office 2007, which was the version of Office that was developed alongside Longhorn, right? So these were part of the same product wave. Um, I had received some mother load of information internally from sources at Microsoft about these products and related products, like the thing that became Home Server and all kinds of other stuff. And so I published articles about all of this uh, as I would. And um, I published something about Office, I don't know what it was, Office 11 or Office 12 or whatever version that was. And um, I got an email from someone named Steven Sanofsky t demanding that I take this article down. It was very early on. I think it was called, well, it was probably just called Office whatever version preview, Office 12 preview, something like that. I had never heard of this guy. And so I looked him up. And uh, I, what I discovered was that he ran Office. And I thought that was kind of interesting. I'd never even heard of this guy. And so because it was the guy that ran Office, I wrote him back and I said, yeah, I can do that. And um I waited until the first beta was released, and then I just put the article back up, whatever. So that year, for whatever reason, Microsoft held their reviewers workshop for what became, I think by that point it was Office 2007. They had it in Brooklyn, in New York, rather than at a normal place in New York City like they would. So you had to go over the, the bridge or whatever, which was kind of a weird thing that they'll never do again. But anyway, he was there. And so it was the first time I ever saw this guy in person. And I don't think I, I'm going out on a limb too much to suggest that he's kind of an odd guy. And so you see the guy on stage. Yeah, there you go. So, <laughs> Wait, what is he doing in this picture? He appears to be doing some kind of planking on a device. Do you, anyone know what that is? Yeah, yeah that's it's a, the uh, Surface. It's the Microsoft Surface with wheels on it. Okay. And um, we learned at the Windows 8 launch that Steven Sanofsky is quite a, uh, a an accomplished skateboard uh, artist, I guess you would mm -hmm. say. How could anybody who likes skateboards be evil? Okay. It can't so, be. Paul, continue, listen, please. Listen, all he is missing is a monocle and a Cheshire cat, and he could be a Bond villain. That's all I'm saying. But this guy was very odd, and I remember seeing him on stage the first time and thinking, wow, this is just a, a weird little guy. But I had had that inter interaction with him via email, and I thought maybe I'd go say hi to him. And I think a lot of times um, you meet people personally, and it, it, it you know solves a lot of issues. So... He was talking to somebody over on the side after the event or in a break during the event. I walked up and I kind of waited and he, they stopped talking for a second. I said, look, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm Paul Throd. And he did this thing where he kind of stepped back and he looked me up and down. And then he just went right back to talking to the other guy. Didn't even, di just completely blew me off. And I thought to myself, well, <laughs> I'm never going to be buddies with this guy, I guess. So. Okay, fine. And I w kind of went on you know, its office. I mean, whatever. So, um, and, but then, of course, a few years later, he took over for Windows. And I thought, oh, this is going to be ugly. You know, <laughs> like of all the guys at Microsoft, like this is the one, maybe the one weird thing I've ever had with anyone at Microsoft. And now he's running the division, which, of course, is the central focus of my life. So good for me, you know. Strange. Do you guys have similar experiences with uh, Julie Larson Green? Have they have they given you the up, up never, once over I've and looked never, away from you? No, I've never met her. So I've far, met so her good. And I have. Um, okay. I get to profile her for a series that I did on the uh, women engineers who work at Microsoft. She was the first one I profiled back in. Uh, wow, when was this? Um, Twenty ten, I think it was, and. She was very nice, um, very personable. Uh, I had heard a lot of stories about her from people who worked at Microsoft saying she was very uh, charming, very good at building coalitions, that people 
thought she was very interesting. Um, she's easy to talk to, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I haven't, have not yet talked to her about windows because in that interview, I was forbidden from talking about windows at all. And they told me if I asked a question about windows that I would be tossed. So I saved it for the end and asked, and then I got tossed. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> This is our life, people. You think it's a glamorous? It was life like when uh, when Bill reporter. Gates walked out on <laughs> Connie Chung, you know. <laughs> See, you know why? Why can Bill Gates be a, be a little bit flippant? Why, why why can certain people get away with this? I mean, how, how could Microsoft allow this guy to be there so long when they let people like Ray Ozzy and Jay Allard go? I mean, they let these people just walk away, but Sanofsky stayed there this whole time, uh, well, ending and moving you, up. What do you know about those people leaving? I mean, I, I, like I said, there were a lot of people that left Microsoft because of this guy. I think there was a collective feeling that the Windows division was basically taking over Microsoft, that everything they wanted to do was the rule. You know, um, we saw that with and the server was. guys. Yeah, right? It was I mean, pretty much. I mean, that that's the thing. It, it, whenever it came down to, it, OK, Windows doesn't like what you're doing. The decision went in favor of Windows. And that's why this was so surprising to me, because I felt yeah. like Balmer had basically capitulated and said, okay, whatever Stephen wants, it's going. And that's going to be how it works from now on. Um, I don't know what changed that. Like who complained? What finally made him see that it was more of a detriment yeah. than I, I don't than think it was a thing. I think it was a, the collective complaining of so many people with the same stories about the same type of behavior that this guy engaged in just again and again and again, and it finally wore him down. I, the other thing is, you know, you can go back and look at the Microsoft financials. Windows used to be the biggest business unit in Microsoft. Now it's the third biggest. I mean, I'm not blaming him, but I, I, don't, I think there are certain market factors that nobody can do anything about. But it is a fact that Windows, as a percentage of Microsoft's revenues quarterly, has actually gone down over the past several years. And most recently, it came in behind, well behind Office and behind Server as well. Yeah, but is that just due to the fact that Windows wasn't refreshed as much? Wasn't this one of uh, Sanofsky's initiatives to have a quicker refresh cycle when it comes to Windows? More like but he something didn't have a quicker refresh schedule. He yeah. released the version every three years. He had a predictable re refresh schedule. I wouldn't say that it was quicker. Well, wasn't that the, I believe that after eight, this was supposed to be the push that this wasn't supposed to start the yearly update cycle to create that same kind of revenue stream. Is, or is, I don't know if that's even going to happen now considering the big change. Well, I, I, yeah. the, yeah, it seems like it will change. I do too. I think so too. I think Blue, which is the release supposedly in mid 2013 of Windows that we keep hearing little bits and pieces about, I think that's still going to come at, at probably mid, mid 2013. Well, let's take a quick break. <laughs> while uh, while, the, while our group therapy session is continuing, we will take <laughs> you guys take a, a breather, and we're going to thank Ford for sponsoring this episode of Windows Weekly. Uh, you know, Ford's got its great sync features, and it just does so many things for you. There's browsing; you can browse your music collection by genre, album, artist, playlist, or song title, all using your voice command. So you're not like fumbling around with little menus or anything. There's playlists. Sync uh, sync allows voice activated control of your media player. It'll even play a list of music you're in the mood for with the Play Similar Music voice command. That's freaking cool. Listen to your entertainment on pretty much any device, voice control music, no matter how it's stored. So if it's on your smartphone, USB drive, or MP3 player, it's got you covered. There's also iTunes tagging. You don't even need to worry about remembering the name of that great song you just heard on the radio. Available sync with My Ford Touch and HD radio technology with iTunes tagging. It lets you tag a song you like, and that gets transferred to your iPod. You can purchase the song directly from the iTunes store at a later time. Best of all, Ford offers sync on every 2012 and 2013 Ford vehicle sold in the United States, including the 2012 Ford Focus. You can learn more about this and other technologies Ford is bringing to its vehicles at Ford.com slash technology. <sighs> Going to let out a breath there. How's everybody doing in our group therapy session? Doing okay? <laughs> We're holding hands. Okay. We're holding yeah. virtual right there. hands. Yeah, yeah. I'm holding avatars, yeah. I guess. Um, <laughs> so with all this stuff said about Steven Sanofsky, I, this is completely off topic entirely. Mm -hmm. Where is he going to end up next? I mean, we, we hear about, we can see all of these stories, <laughs> I can right? tell you exactly where he's going, I ask. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in the business world. Oh, well, sorry, sorry. In the business world, where, where will this gentleman show up? Will anybody want to hire somebody as high profile and potentially as divisive as mm -hmm. Steven Sanofsky, uh, considering his oh, yeah, many, many stories. Uh, most companies don't have the multiple product divisions that Microsoft has. I mean, I, he would be an amazing person 
to come into a, a very focused technology company that had maybe that one major product line or whatever and, uh, and do the turnaround thing. I mean, I look at Steven Snofsky like a fixer, you know, the guy who comes in to fix something that's broken. Uh, not that Office was broken, but I mean, uh, you know, he did, a, I, I think, a solid job there, certainly, for many years. And uh, Windows obviously needed to be fixed. And um, I think, he, you know, it, it was sort of a credibility thing. I, I've, I've compared, um, this is a little terrible, but I've compared him many times to MacArthur, you know, uh, where he was the right guy in World War II in the Pacific. And uh, even though actually... Everyone back at, in Washington couldn't stand the guy because he was an egomaniac and, and didn't actually uh, contribute, they felt, in any meaningful way to the war. He was the right guy from sort of a PR standpoint. People really respected him and they thought he was the right guy. And so when the Korea War started, he went to Korea and then he wanted to nuke China. And he's a crazy person. And so you got to bring him home. you got to get him out of there. And I think we've finally seen the, the China moment for Steven Sanofsky. There, there, again, there wasn't any one thing, I don't believe, but just a mounting series of, I think, the same thing over and over again. Um, the very little things that he did to us, Mary Jo and I and other people like us, um, were, I think, duplicated again and again and again, internally especially, at a much higher level. And uh, I think that's what did it. But, I, yeah, sure, a smaller company um, that needs help, um, definitely, definitely. I don't see him not working. Mary Joe, do you have an idea where he'll, he'll end up? Will he run his own uh, tablet slash uh, skateboard <laughs> company? The, the or is he going to just wind, wind up in a major? Was he going to be like Google's next pick? Why not? <laughs> uh, wow. You know, I thought it was funny when people were joking that maybe Forstall would come to Microsoft and Sanofsky would go to Apple. But I don't think he would work at Apple either. Um, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I could see him doing his own kind of a startup, maybe. And maybe getting some of the people from Microsoft who did like working with him and found his ways something they they uh, benefited from. I don't know. Maybe it, that's actually going to be very interesting to see too. How many people now go uh, either with him or just leave because they liked the way things were and they don't want to stay now that they they may change. So wait, you're you're actually suggesting somebody liked being under the rule of Sanofsky. Um there are people who did. Um, yeah. In fact, there's uh, there's a very uh, interesting blog post from Zari Obasanjo, who works at Microsoft, who worked on the uh, Windows Live team for a long time, about why he liked working for Steven Sanofsky. And he has many reasons in his post. Um, and he, he actually is somebody who's been very vocal, saying this is her horrible, this is really going to hurt Windows, that he's being let go. I disagree with the direction here. So, yes, there are people here, there who well, of course there found are, though, right? his I mean style positive yeah there are people like julie larson green who owe their uh careers to him of course i mean of course there are people who feel that i mean i don't mean to compare it to uh like a cult or something but i mean obviously there are people that buy into this guy's vision i mean um yes we used to be really transparent and no we are not going to do that anymore i mean there's some people who are like yeah that's right that's exactly right we need to do that you know people of course there are going to be people who buy into that but i think there's going to be a lot more people who uh, we're going to start hearing from now on the record and off from in, inside and around Microsoft are going to say, are saying, already are saying, finally. You know, I actually was surprised it happened this quickly, but always knew this would end badly. Could it just be that he's just not very good at being a team player and he should just be the lead of a company, a CEO, a top top dog when it comes to things? Because no, he would hey, be a terrible CEO. Well, he would terrible. tell everyone what to do and there wouldn't be any collaboration because he didn't say there'd be any collaboration. No, he's not. He, he's, <laughs> this, is one, this is one thing a lot of people, I want, this is one thing we should talk about, you know, um, what, some of the initial reaction around him uh, leaving Microsoft was, oh, that's a shame. I thought he was going to be the next CEO. He would have been a great CEO. No, he would have been a terrible CEO. Uh, the, a CEO has completely different requirements than uh, a, someone who's leading a product drive like he was. Um, you know, Steve Ballmer, a lot of people complain about the guy, but actually, I think he's the right guy for the job. And I also think that people misunderstand why Bill Gates was, for a time, a good CEO. And it had nothing to do with his technical acumen it had to do with the fact that he was an incredible businessman and that's what steve Ballmer is um steven sanofsky absolutely has strengths um there's no doubt about it but he would never have been a good ceo never and there's if you're watching the video version of windows weekly you're seeing bill gates in an interview with connie chung leaping over a chair demonstrating his incredible athleticism uh I don't believe that's how he left the interview. Is that is that correct, or is that just <laughs> what he was doing there? That's that's such a great clip. I mean, there there are so many Bill Gates stories like that too, right? Where I mean, uh, p 
people people who didn't know Bill Gates in the early days, you know, they they just see the Bill Gates now, who's very polished speaker, very affable, very easy to get along with interviewers his hair and, is and with his colleagues. Exactly. And, <laughs> you know. and you know, I another another just random thought. I I mean Steven Sonofsky was Bill Gates' technical assistant. That was one of his first jobs, if not his first job at Microsoft. And in those days, it was okay to be the way Bill Gates was. And Bill Gates was incredibly condescending. He was incredibly difficult and prickly and not easy to interview, I can attest. And I bet Paul can too. Um, sure. So, you know, the, yeah, but you know he may have that, just thought this was okay. That was, uh, you know, people talk about Steve Jobs and how awful he was to people. And Steve Jobs had this, you know, in the, in the biography by Walter Isaacson, Isaacson there's a clip where, or a part where he talks about how he just bought a bunch of the same shirt. This is something he didn't want to think about, you know. Uh, Bill Gates used to get up and go to work when he was younger. He wouldn't comb his hair, wouldn't brush his teeth, he wouldn't get dressed, he would just wear whatever he was wearing. And obviously that makes you look like a homeless person, but also it is representative of the drive that this person only cares about this one thing. They're, they're, this other stuff is, does not matter to them. And um, so, you know, I guess there are different ways you can look at those kind of traits. I mean... Uh, Steven Sanofsky was also driven as well, um, maybe a little bit more manic, <laughs> you know, a little, uh, a, you know, a, a little lighter on the positive aspects of it, I guess. Um, so, you know, we're going to be dealing with this guy's legacy for a long time to come. I mean, he's gone, but he's not really gone. Um, and so uh, the next few months are going to be very interesting. I'm curious to see what what and whether uh, Julie Larson Graham and Tell Me Reller stick around, what they do. Um, whether they introduce a new president, whether it is someone from inside the company or outside, uh, who that might be, uh, and what changes of direction or, or subtle evolutions of direction that we see. But um, hey, this it can't be understated how huge this is, how absolutely huge this is. We could understate it by talking about other Microsoft news, if you guys so desire. I, I, have, I, I could talk about Sanofsky for about two hours, I think. I would love to hear about it. <laughs> but it's up to you guys. Do you guys want to move on or do you want to still talk Sanofsky? Completely open. <laughs> Well, let's just make sure we've hit on everything. I mean, is there everything. anything in the notes that we have? Uh, let's see. Cross-divisional reorganization. Monster with the – this thing now. <laughs> Actually, uh, let, me, I'll just, let me just tell you, let me tell you one story. And this is a – this is not a personal story. This is not a, a necessarily an example of why this guy is a complete jerk. But I'll, I'll give you a peek at an alternate future, something that could have happened. And I think a lot of people are going to nod their heads because this is something we all sort of dreamed that was possible and could have happened and maybe uh, would have happened if Sanofsky wasn't in place, which is this. Uh, some years ago, um, there was uh, different organizations inside of Microsoft that were looking at how Windows could go forward into this new world. And one of the ideas that came up was this notion of um, we could have a Silverlight runtime that would run on top of the NT kernel and on top of uh, NT core, you know, the kind of Minwin type thing. And that this could be something that would run next to Win32 and that it could be a path to the future. And uh, when presented with this possibility, Steven Sanofsky shot it down immediately. And my explanation of that is what I said before, that this guy was the ultimate not invented here guy. Like he didn't like this because it didn't come from his team and would have no part of it and that they were going to do their own thing. The thing that's interesting about that scheme I just mentioned is that uh, a team at Microsoft did pick it up. It was the Windows Phone team. And they used this runtime for their the initial version of Windows Phone, Windows Phone 7. Anyone who has written applications for this operating system will tell you that it is one of the cleanest APIs. It is a, an absolute joy to develop for. It is something that had Microsoft done that for mainstream desktop windows probably would have been an awesome thing. And all those people who have ever used Windows Phone and thought, wow, this thing would be awesome on a tablet, that's what that would have been. Um, there was a group at Microsoft that made it and were talked about making it, and eventually it just went to Windows Phone. Now, what the Windows group did on the flip side was basically recreate it, do the APIs over from scratch. There's some good stuff that comes out of it. You know, you get sort of a functional parity between all of the programming languages um, uh, that maybe you wouldn't have had through Silverlight. Maybe it wouldn't have been quite as uh, seamless. You didn't certainly couldn't have brought in that world of HTML type programmers and so forth. But on the other hand, you're also you're also kind of putting things back a few years because when you release a 1.0 version of an API you by definition are not going to be as mature and complete as APIs that have been around for longer periods of time. And I, I think anyone uh, who looks at the WinRT stuff in Windows 8 will tell you, yeah, it's, it's pretty solid, it's clean, but it's behind. You know, it, it's going to need some, some evolution to catch up. And so in many ways, by doing their own thing, they set Windows back 
years, you know, um, that they will get there probably, but they could have, they had, Silverlight was there. It was just, it, it just had the bad luck of being invented by other people at Microsoft. You know, that was its only sin. You know, um, pe the people that wanted to do that are, um, are absolutely cheering the fact that this guy is gone. But the fact remains that that train has left the station because the Silverlight APIs were, of course, replaced in Windows Phone 8 as well. And so now we're all kind of running down this WinRT track, uh, whether we want to or not. But, you know, there's a little, uh, this sort of a an alternate you know, timeline, something else that could have happened that, you know, I think most people would agree would have been pretty special and pretty neat. And it was just squashed because it wasn't invented by his team. Larry, what do you think of this alternate reality? Is it all <laughs> dun, good dun, in the alternate dun. reality or is our reality yeah. just awful right now? No, I, I, I think that's that's a very interesting scenario. And I, I'm sure there are many more like it that we could uh, talk about. Um, Net docs. <laughs> yeah, that's I mean, like, we could like go a way list back. Of all the things that he yeah. killed because it wasn't invented by his team. You know? Yeah, I mean, there is there is quite a list. Um, the uh, one legacy that does endure, though, with him going, and I, I wonder how long this will last in Microsoft. I, I have a feeling it's here to stay. Is the way that he um, convinced Ballmer to reorganize the company. And he, Stephen Sanofsky wrote a management book uh, that's pretty well known. Uh, I think it's called, is it called One, One Strategy? One Strategy is the title, oh, Organization awesome. Planning. It is so readable and, and understandable, <laughs> and it's just, mm. <laughs> it's your pick of the <laughs> You know week. what I'm saying? It's your audible pick of the week. Uh, no, yeah. The reason I brought it up, though, is it, the, what he describes in this book is having a structure where there are three people who report to a chief in each division. So in in Windows, for example, he had himself as the president, and then he had three people reporting to him, the head of product planning, uh, the head of test, and the head of development, I think. Uh, and that structure became the structure that permeated Microsoft because he showed that it worked in Windows. So that's the structure that's in server and tools now. That's a structure throughout the company, pretty much. And that structure, it, while it did contribute very positively to Windows getting its act together, it has not worked as well in some of the other divisions. And it has resulted in some people being driven out who are more senior uh, and who uh, didn't really fit into this kind of uh, role where the idea is these three people make all the decisions and everybody else reports up through them. There wasn't a lot of space anymore for people who are very creative or very senior people um, who were like technical fellows and distinguished engineers at Microsoft. They, they didn't really fit in this new way of things being organized to report up through this, this hierarchy. And it's going to be interesting to me to see if this stays in place now that he's gone or if Microsoft decides that structure actually didn't really work that well and it ended up in some very senior and very important people leaving. Okay, I'm, I'm going to call it. I think I think our group therapy session We're has done. reached the hour. <laughs> Let's talk about another uh, Microsoft executive who got a new job title. It was Andy Lease. I think he was. I think he was sitting on the playground or something on Microsoft, one of those little uh, those little daycare centers. <laughs> they're like, "Hey, we, you're you're a president of Windows Phone, right? You're not doing anything. Steven's gone. <laughs> Wait, do is something? he really? Was he really still president of Windows Phone? I believe he's he was technically still president of uh, Windows really? Phone. Yeah. Terry Myerson became president. I, I saw one article that said he was president, and I've seen. I thought he. I thought he moved. But he was in, doing sideways. a time critical thing. Now he's the, the VP of corporate strategy and development, whatever that means. Uh, yep. What what exactly is this? Just because Stevens and Ofsky is gone, the boogeyman's gone, so Andy can come back inside, or what, what happened there? I know the timing was so crazy, right? Like the, everything happening this week. So a Andy Lee's, we didn't really know what was going on with him for a while. We knew he had this secret. Thing he was working on, which it seems like it was the relationship with Barnes and Noble and Microsoft, because that's the only context we saw him quoted in for the past year or so. And then suddenly he has a new title this week, and he's now working for the CFO, uh, Peter Klein at Microsoft. And his job, like you said, is strategy and planning or whatever. And he's actually uh, he's overseeing some very senior people, like some of the mergers and acquisition specialists at Microsoft. So. This is a very interesting choice, um, and uh, I don't know what else to say about it beyond that. <laughs> well, let's see, Andy Lee's. I think I think Paul was uh, betting money on what. What did Andy Lee successfully 
Or what exactly was he the, was he the head of while he was? I just tell me what he did. Somebody, I, what are you kidding me? Who is this guy? Like what? <laughs> I, I this is crazy. I, I've never understood this guy. I just don't. Well, does what that mean he? he's the right guy for Windows? Is he the right guy for Microsoft's no, corporate strategy? No. If you don't understand him, because that sounds about right. <laughs> No. I don't know. <laughs> head shaking. The, the audio listeners, the head shaking. I wish you could hear and see the, the, the distaste in Paul's face. Of this. this is a Sanofsky style snubbing right here. This face of disgust. Okay, so you don't really care <sighs> for Randy Lee's. Um, I just don't understand what the point of him is. I, I, I don't know what he does. I, I Can somebody tell me? What does he do? Yeah, I, I'm curious if he. I'm curious if he had a role in the Microsoft Barnes and Noble relationship, uh, like actually you know forging what? that relationship. But what what is the result of this? They we don't they know just yet. released we, more Android devices, and right. they have an app in the in the Windows Store, which frankly doesn't put them in very strong company. I mean, what, what's the what? That's what he's accomplished. I mean, what I. Yeah, we don't know. I, I don't think we know yet what's going to happen. Like, is there going to be a reader, right? That's still a rumor. There's going to be a Wook, Windows-based Nook. Right? <laughs> Love that word, by the way. Well, I'm <laughs> trademarking that. <laughs> They're going to have to buy that one off me. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, we don't know. We don't know. And, and you know, it. I, I agree with you, Paul. We don't know what he's been doing beyond that for the past year. And it'll be interesting to see where he's quoted going forward, which deals that Microsoft engages in he's credited as having had a part in we, we just don't know right yet what i think he's going to be doing so let's see does microsoft just promote people they don't really know who's there what, I, I don't understand so snuffy rises they throw out people and they're like you're sitting there you have a new vp job they, they can't well, be he clearly what? does there, something of value right he's he's, he's, he's no a vp now it's like what were you doing before were you like cleaning up the floors or something what, what's the deal you're refilling the the drink machine what what is your function you know do you, do you know anything about windows phone uh don't worry about it i i don't I just don't know where he came from. I, I other than like England or something. I mean, I what what's the No, he he worked what, on what server. What is your function? He worked on server for a long time, Windows Server, right? Did he? Did he? He worked yes, he on did. server. He worked on server. <laughs> All right. Before he came to Windows Phone, I know he was on Windows Server. Um and that's why a lot of people were surprised when he came to phone because they said, "Okay, here's a guy from server. What does he know about phone?" I right, I asked that question after I watched him do a presentation about phone and I and my initial reaction was like, and who are you again? Like, I don't even, I just don't get where this person came from. You know, people like Terry Morrison get up on stage at Jill Belfiore and you're like, yeah, okay, yep, got it. Andy Lee's, it's like, what? See, what? Nobody, nobody hates Joe. There's no beef with Joe. Nobody you know? hates Joe. <laughs> he comes up with kids, he's got phones, he's got demos that don't necessarily work, he's got Jessica Alba showing up, and nobody yep. hates Joe, you know? I think nobody hates Joe. He might be the model for uh, the, Xbox avatars might, and... Everything Literally else. be a model, yeah. There he is. There's, <laughs> everybody loves Joe. I'm a little freaked that you have a frame picture of Joe Belfiore, but I, I guess yeah. I understand it. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, who? wait, you don't have one? Not yet. I'm sure everyone. I thought they There's were just some issue. space on my wall back there, though, so maybe I could I could probably make that yeah, happen. Yeah, you could, you could put it on your by your, your exercise machine there. It's like motivation. Be like Joe. Be like <laughs> Joe. Be, I, I have no idea. But yeah, anyway, <laughs> anyway, Andy Lee's back at Microsoft with an actual position. So good, good for him uh, because, again, Microsoft's like a government agency. Just stay there How long enough. How are we enough. still talking about Andy Lee's? Who is this guy? <laughs> I'm asking the experts here. I'm hoping you guys would know. Come on, help me here. But anyway. We told well, you everything we know. He's a man and he's got a job. That's good for him. He and is an enigma. Yes. He's an enigma wrapped in a riddle. Uh, so let's see what else happened. So there, there are ads in Windows 8. You know, I've been playing with, yeah. uh, with Windows 8 a lot on this Lenovo uh, Yoga, which is a whole other animal, I'll say that. But when I <laughs> what, 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 what do you think about the Yoga? I'm curious. Yeah. I think it was an interesting design exercise, and I think it should have oh, stayed geez. as that. I don't believe like a concept car that doesn't. Yeah, quite I mean, make like sense you know what? This is. I mean, this is nifty. Let me let me hold, show up a start screen or something. All right, like, one second. Any day now. Like, oh, look, that's that's useful, right? I mean, I can show what I'm doing on, on my desktop here. Uh, I can turn it over, and I can place it face down on the keyboard, which leads to gunk being on the keyboard. Because for, for some reason, there's no, like, little uh, yeah, like, yeah. feet or pads here. So when you turn this over, it will get cruddy. There's really no good way to hold this because your hand's on the trackpad or keys. Yeah. So, right. And the button is actually somewhat the Windows button here. 
uh, it's, it's yeah, this it's weird no like place. bezel that it's a little bit strange to push, which is the only button you have as a tablet. So I'd say overall, uh, why'd you do this? All right, but let me, let me throw out an happen? alternate alternate view of this device, right? So obviously a lot of people are going to want tablets and, and, you know, traditional tablets. You can plug them into keyboard docks and stuff. But, you know, that device is basically just an ultra book that also does this other stuff. And so if the tablet use of this machine is something you would only do very occasionally, I mean, that's the point. In other words, it's actually a, it's a nice laptop, right, just by itself. But you can flip it over when you want to occasionally to do the tablet stuff. So maybe you're stuck on a plane, you want to watch a movie. You know, it works fine. The touch is there and you can get it going. And the fact that the guy's got a seat down in front of you doesn't impact the experience. So I, I, I guess it's, you know, it's not meant to be a pure tablet replacement. It's it's for those people who actually do need the keyboard most of the time, but would occasionally like to have the the tablet part. That That's one way to put it, I guess. I'm just trying out my eventual review on you to see how that I'm, I'm a big fan. I mean, if, if I was going to pick a design, I'd pick the older design where you can flip the screen and turn it yeah. over, like the old convertible laptops. I kind of like that. They actually sell one of those too, by the way. Well, I mean, uh, that's why I'm conf does. curious and somewhat confused about the yoga in general when it comes to right. that. Obviously, the hinge is very, very rigid because it's got to be able to hold up all those configurations. Yep. So, I mean, Although, by the way, uh, push your finger into the area right below the window button on the bezel here and in, yeah into the actual laptop screen part of it oh. see how it kind of flexes in oh yeah oh, look at that yeah i don't like that <laughs> that that part makes me a little nervous <laughs> i did not I try do, that I, I do kind of wonder because you're going to be pushing there a lot because you're pushing the button i oh, know i don't use that button because i think it's, it, it didn't work All right, well, right I mean, away. you could imagine one would be pushing there a lot because no, you gotta use, your, use your charm bar which actually obviously didn't work right there there we go there's my start button that's all i need no, okay, you, I'm just pointing out something I noticed. A little bit of flex. You noticed that it just, well, yeah, it would break there, I guess. Eh. Again, design exercise. Maybe <laughs> should sure. not have happened in real life. Uh, I'm very curious yeah. about this. Oh, no, well, hey, look, it, it's, a, it's a decent laptop. I can't tell if the software is buggy because the, the, uh, the, the touchscreen keyboard keeps coming up. It's like, hey, you that look is, like you want to start yeah. typing. I'm in the laptop mode. I have a it keyboard. Should, yeah, shouldn't I don't, happen. I don't need that to happen. I'm not sure which, what's the problem. Uh, because it could be on either side. I, I, I don't like that you're suggesting that Windows 8 isn't perfect, but that's not supposed to happen. Well, <laughs> when you're using like a first <laughs> rev on that and a first rev piece yeah, of hardware. I'm, I'm surprised no one has raised these concerns before about Windows 8. Windows um, 8? No. I don't even know how we got on this. How did we start <laughs> talking about the yoga for some reason? We were talking about Windows 8 or something. I, I completely forgot. That's great. Um should we talk more about Joe and Windows oh, Phone? We were talking about ads. We were oh, about ads. ads. Thank you. I completely got lost. I, I couldn't <laughs> scroll because I have this reverse scrolling thing on Windows 8. So I'm like, so I'm in the dock and I'm like over here, but I'm yep. supposed to be up here. So thank you, Windows 8, for making my head hurt. There we go. That's much better. We're talking about ads <laughs> you, you in need Windows to 8. You need to do a downward dog. Come on. Okay, so down, you got a yoga. Downward, Let's go. Downward yoga dog. There you go. <laughs> what? You I, I do have a Mac. I turned off that reverse natural scrolling. Natural scrolling is like the work of the devil. Wow. <laughs> Natural. And now, now it's on Windows 8. Yes, I'm really glad that it's on both things that are broken. Thank you for screwing up everything, everybody. Uh, anyway, I'll use like, my surface here. I like here. the scrolling. I'll put this right here. How about that? Is that, is that better, everybody? I got my surface on top of my... Um, there we go. Got my keyboard. This is totally the, the way to go, right? Two screens. Anyway, so there are ads <laughs> on Windows 8. Why are there ads yeah. on Windows 8? So Paul and I disagree about this. Well, right. let, Paul, let Paul go first. I, I'm not positive. We, I, no, I, I think I've been we, misunderstood. We somewhat disagree. We yeah, somewhat I, I, disagree. I, the, my point is not for now. Like Right now, they're very subtle, and they're only in some apps. They're actually not subtle in some of the apps, like the music and the video apps are very overt in your face. But you know, in the Bing apps, they're very subtle. Now, people who kind of... I don't, and I'm, I don't mean to include Mary Jo in this. I was going to say people who apologize for Microsoft. But certain people would say uh, those ads don't bother me because they are really hard to find. They're subtle uh, and fair enough. And they'll make this argument. Well, did you really expect to get all this free content over years and years and that you wouldn't have to pay for it in some way? And my, my point is just twofold. One is that ads have never appeared in Windows before. And they're there now. Uh, these apps ship as part of Windows 8 and are pre-installed whether you want them or not. So the ads are in Windows 8. That's a fact. They're, but they're also subtle. They're not in your face. And so a lot of people are saying, well, what's the big deal? The big deal is that this is what they did to the Xbox. And so as a paying customer of Xbox Live Gold, 
I think it's reasonable for me not to see ads in the Xbox dashboard when it's there for me to help me navigate from experience to experience. But this thing in the latest update is overloaded with ads. I mean, ads are <laughs> someone has digitally super. <laughs> Just noticed the Joe thing. That's good. Um, <laughs> someone, someone has uh, Alex, I assume, has digitally superimposed uh, the Joe B uh, picture on the. I don't wall. believe he superimposed anything. That just appears. I, I told you, yeah, it, just, it just comes with the territory. He is a, a holy magic. relic for me. Yeah, so um, pretty soon I'm going to have like Joe B stigmata happening. But anyway, I'll make my kids come in here and do a little demo or something. So I just think that this is a slippery slope, and that's my concern. I, I don't. I'm not saying it's a big deal in Windows 8. It is a big deal that they did it at all. And it is the beginning of the acceptance and that this is how this stuff happens. When people don't complain, they'll go further and further and further. And then we'll get to the point where we're going to have ads everywhere. And, and the final point I just want to make about ads is this. Ads on the web are well understood. When we go to web pages, we can remove ads if we want to, if we know how. Like there's a way to do it. But once you start putting ads in mobile apps, those cannot be removed unless they allow you to do it on an app-by-app -app basis. There's no global plugin you can put in Windows to get rid of ads, and there never will be. And that's why those ads are so valuable to Microsoft and to the companies that are advertising. It's an insidious way to get ads in front of you that can't be removed. And I agree that they're not a big deal now, but the fact that they're doing it, I think, is a bad precedent. And you also have the Xbox to look at where they've really screwed up the user experience. And that's what I'm worried about. But they're all in tiles. So here's, here's, here's my take. Here's my take yep. on this. So as Paul has said, there are definitely ads and there's a lot of ads. And um, some people find them offensive. Some people don't. Okay. But they're in the apps. They're, like this, this story keeps getting reported as Windows 8 has ads in the operating system. And yes, these apps come pre-installed on, on many machines with Windows 8. Um, and when you get the Surface, you have a lot of these apps already on your Surface. But they're not in the operating system. Like the apps are separate. You can dump them. You can just get rid of them if you don't like them. Yep. Also, um, these apps, the ones that have some very prominent ads like the finance app and the, and the sports, the news, these, are, these were developed by the Bing team at Microsoft. There's a sub, subset of the Bing team called the App X team. And they're, they're just doing free apps uh, where they are paying for content and using content from places like Reuters and AP and the way they're subsidizing these being free is through ads. So if you hate ads, don't, don't use these apps, but I, I like these apps for the most part. I like the weather app. I like oh, the I uh, news app. Yeah. Yep. So it, you've got to decide, like, can you, can you deal with apps, ads with ads in apps or not? That's your choice. The issue though is I can't, first of all, no one has, this is not presented to you. Hey, by the way, we have some ads now. Uh, do you want these or do you not want them? And you can't say no. Uh, do you want the apps without the ads? Uh, maybe you could pay a little bit extra. Maybe I already pay Microsoft a lot of money for Xbox Live Gold, for Office 365, for, you know. I mean, at, at what point does my constant payment to Microsoft result in me not seeing ads? Like, at no point. I mean, there's no, there is no alternative. That's the problem. Like, I like the news app. But if I want to use it, I have to put up with the ads. But if, no. if suddenly Windows 8 had a big honking app in the middle of it, ad, I would be like, what? What the heck? Yeah. I paid well, for this, they will right? in Windows 9. <laughs> I mean, that's my point. I, that, that's where this goes. I mean, and they've done it. And again, this is not like something I made up because I'm a conspiracy theorist. They did this in the Xbox. And, I, and yeah. I've heard from many, many people who are like, exactly. I pay uh, X amount of dollars every year for this thing. How, how could they possibly show ads on this thing? Um, but there are people who make the argument about like, well, newspaper, you pay for newspapers and newspapers come with ads, you know. Yeah, that's nice. And newspapers are, are, are a new technology model. I can see where you could compare the two. But I, I think the issue is simply that Windows is Microsoft's core product. It needs to be held to a higher standard. It's, this is not some cheap blog or something. It's, it's not like a, a guy in his parents' basement, you know, trying to make money on Google ads. It's Microsoft. Like, Microsoft should use this as a demonstration of its platform capabilities. If they want to uh, have a version that can have ads so they can show how, uh, you know, other app developers how they can put ads in their apps, that's fine. But I, I just think it's something that you should be able to turn off and it shouldn't be included by default in the OS as it is. I could go on and on. Does so you go with the ahead. Amazon model, you pay a little extra, you never have to see an ad again? That kind of, unless the cost is well, coming down. But, on the okay, actually Amazon's another example. So, 
uh, one of the things I, one of the cases I've made on the, in the case of the Kindle devices is that they have something called special offers on these devices, which I like. And so it's a way for you to save money and you can get these offers that are usually for, you know, I, I just used one the other day. It's uh, pay $4 and get a, an album that costs $8 on Amazon MP3, which is something I'm doing anyway, buying music from this company. If I don't want them, I can pay not to have them, right? They, uh, they also went over the line in this rever revision of their products where on the home screen of their devices, they were having uh, what essentially was an ad at the bottom of the screen where you would select something like the Boston Globe and it would say other Amazon customers also liked and there would be pictures of the New York Times, the Washington Post, you know, USA Today, whatever the publications were. Now, in my review of that product, what I wrote was this is over the line because they don't offer a way for you to opt out of that, which is something they should be doing. By the way, now they do. And that opt out is free on the Kindle. So there are right ways to do it and there are wrong ways. And I, I think it's a learning thing. And hopefully enough people will complain where Microsoft will step back from this because the alternative, like I said, is the 360, and it is ugly what they've done to the Xbox. The other thing is, traditionally, Amazon is trying to sell you things. Microsoft usually sells you the product, and that's usually Amazon the is it. is the Walmart of the internet, and uh, you know maybe Microsoft could strive to be better than that. That's just a thought. Just a thought. I, I got to tell you, until this whole de debate came up, I didn't even <laughs> notice there were ads in in these yeah. apps because I think I shouldn't admit this. Working on a an ad sponsored site like I do, um, sure. but. I don't even see ads anymore on the web I mean, or even in apps. I don't even notice them. I just, my eye, I guess, just skips over them. Like, oh, yeah, whatever, I, I don't uh, know what that is. I'm people have said to me, how could, Paul, it's ironic that you would complain about this. Your site has ads on it. Yeah. You know, uh, me, the individual, the one guy who contributes to my website, it should be compared to Microsoft, the multi-billion dollar corporation that has affiliates in every <laughs> country on earth. I mean, <laughs> we have a lot, we have a lot in common. I could see why you would make that distinction. I, I <laughs> It's crazy. I mean, it's it's Microsoft. This is Windows. They have 1.3 billion customers. Come on. But, right. you know, Bing is part of the online services division, which is in the red. They need all the money they can get over there. Just putting uh, ads uh, on uh, everything. Sure. If I could round off the, the pennies on my, you know, pay stub and give it to Bing, I would totally do that. I know you would. <laughs> <laughs> We should I get love to, those guys. So I'm assuming, by the way, that since this week has been so crazy with Microsoft news, that po folks on Twitter have probably been hitting you up with lots of questions. Do you? Do you uh, it's been quiet, really. Been quiet, I really. Uh -huh. uh, well, I, I got a question here from Twitter uh, from our, one of our <laughs> listeners. Anyway, what do you think Microsoft will announce at CES this year or next year? I guess, <laughs> or will Microsoft just do their own thing? Do you think they're going to just uh, show off anything, or just do the same old giant booth with nothing in it? They're not going to CES. Well, we already yeah, know. So. They, That's they've easy. withdrawn from <laughs> CES. Well, there you go, Nathan. Well, they're going to announce yeah, nothing. But, but I bet that about around that time, we could hear maybe a first little sneak preview on the next Xbox 720, Durango, whatever you want to call it. Wouldn't they save that for E3 anyway? Why would they bother with CES? Maybe a I teaser or Xbox yeah. Surface or something like I that. I would hope something sooner than E3 uh, to announce the 720 or whatever that's called. Yeah. And by the way, just because they're not officially there doesn't mean they can't be there. You know, a lot of companies will go to Vegas the week of CES. They'll rent out a, a suite at some hotel. And they can invite the press through in a uh, in much smaller volume, but also in a way that you can have more one-on-one -on -one time. And uh, uh, certainly in my years of going to CES, I've done a lot of that kind of stuff. And I think Microsoft could do, uh, could do that very effectively. So hopefully they will do that. I was asked this question on Twitter by Andrew B. with the awesome Batman avatar. So I have to ask it. Reviews <laughs> on first generation Windows 8 hardware seems tep. Seems tep I can't pinch and zoom on this. <laughs> Reviews yep. on first generation Windows 8 hardware seems tepid so far. Who's going to make the must-have device? Right. Who's Probably Lenovo. <laughs> this, this is not it. That might not be it. But okay. again, you know, uh, different people, different tastes and so forth. Um, the ThinkPad 2 is something very interesting, I think, to look at. Um, you I know, think we'll Surface, see. I, Pro. Surface, Surface Pro, Pro. Yeah. is going to be Wait, maybe the Pro? one. Pro? Yeah, that's the one coming in January that's going to run Windows oh, 8. Pro. Not eating Crow. Not I eating heard Crow. CR on that one. <laughs> no, that's true, right? I mean, that that's going to be interesting. Um, I, it's weird to me how uninteresting a lot of this first gen hardware is, you know, right out the bat, right off the bat. Um, I don't know what to attribute that to. 
I just saw your bear pick of the week. That's an awesome pick, by the way. I'm sorry. Isn't it? <laughs> that's, that's, a, yeah. that's amazing. I, I'm sorry. But I sorry, listeners. Your, your questions Don't are great, but anything. beer. <laughs> Beer's coming up soon if you want to know. Sorry. I, that's, uh, it's important to me that you someday visit that place in person. But anyway. Yes. Um, I... <laughs> I am surprised by how bad the hardware is uh, right off the bat. So we'll see. I mean, there's some devices that I had seen up front that are very, that were very interesting that I've not seen in person yet. Uh, there was an Acer Iconia, I think it's a W510 or W5 series, whatever that was. Um, really thin, light, beautiful looking uh, Clover Trail based machine. I have a, a Samsung Ative um, Smart PC, I think is the name of it, which is a Clover Trail based machine, which is, you know, it's fine. It's, it's, it's not really, it's not that it's special in any way, but it's kind of a low end machine. Uh, alternative to the ARM stuff, uh, potentially interesting. Um, yeah, it, it's, it, I, w I would have thought, I think we probably said this, you know, by now I would have expected to have been able to come up here and say, okay, if you're looking for this, here you go. If you're looking for this, here you go. And um, it's not that easy. So. Well, while Paul's eager about picks, let's, let's, uh, let's <laughs> stop for a second, take a break. And let's thank okay. Audible. Because with this episode of Windows Weekly is brought to you by Audible.com. Now, Audible.com, you know these guys. They're the leading provider of audiobooks. More than 100,000 downloadable titles. So if you like if you like fiction, you'll find that there. If you like nonfiction, you'll find it at Audible. If you want periodicals, you'll find them at Audible. For listeners of Windows Weekly, Audible is offering a free audiobook to give you a chance to try out their service. Uh, Paul, you've got a pick for, yep. for the Audible uh, pick today. What, what exactly is it? What, what book are you reading uh, via your ears? I actually am doing this one via my ears. So a lot of, sometimes uh, my Audible picks are like just books that I've read in the past and um, they're just great books. But this one I actually have gotten on Audible and it is excellent. It is, um, and I've just started it. I've only barely started it. It's just, but it's so clearly excellent. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, The Art of Power, which I believe was just released uh, by John Meacham, um, is just an absolutely, fa it's just, fascinating and i have to admit i'm i love history um i know almost nothing about thomas jefferson almost nothing and um he's an interesting guy you know there's uh history has a way of um masking things that are bad about people <laughs> you know that you uh i think a lot of people will uh, come out with some basic facts about thomas jefferson and we kind of have our uh, only very basic understanding of the man but he was actually fairly complex and um was not uh, maybe as uh, perfect as some of us would would remember or would think, I guess. Um, not remember. <laughs> so, uh, since he's obviously been dead for 200 years. But anyway, <laughs> uh, this is a good one. This is a really good one. I don't know if this one is one you can get for free, unfortunately. I guess you raised that issue before the show. It's possible that this is a, a book you would have to buy because it is fairly expensive. Um, but it is, it is awesome. And if you like this kind of thing... Um, this is it's it's fantastic, and I'm, I um, well, there's a side story about how I, I I've completely changed the way I consume Audible content now because now they have these awesome uh, mobile apps, and you can do the buying from the device, you know, and depending on which device you have, you can go, you know, there's a website you can tell, you know, go back to the app and it appears immediately, you can download it and everything. And, um, this is one of the titles I bought recently, so I did it that way, and I, I sort of had that moment where it was just, it's really interesting how this has evolved over time because it used to be a really painful affair where you would go to the web on a PC, you could download it to some terrible application and sync it, and um, this stuff has just gotten so much better, and you can just log in with your credentials, library pops up, grab it, and, and you go. It's really, really neat, but that's obviously a side story, but um, this is a good one if you like history. Paul, going against the grain, Lincoln right now is the, is the sweetheart, thanks to the movie. Going with Thomas Jefferson on Well, Audible. I did previously recommend Lincoln uh, Vampire Hunter, which is also excellent, and I believe a true story. <laughs> well, if, you, if, you, if you want to download a book for, from, from audible.com for free, go to audible.com slash windows. Again, it's audible, very discerning. <laughs> it's audible.com slash windows where you can try out an audio book. And by the way, Aud uh, Audible is doing a great promotion right now. You can get a copy of Brandon Sanderson's Legion absolutely free at audible.com slash Sanderson. There's no trial needed. There's no credit card required for this free book. This is Audible's gift to you. That's audible.com slash Sanderson. That's audible.com slash S-A-N-D-E-R-S-O-N. -S we thank Audible for their sponsorship of Windows Weekly. So we were talking picks because Paul was just so excited. Uh, but let's talk about software before we talk about beer. What's the uh, software pick of the week this week? Actually, so I have two software picks listed, but there's a third I should 
I should add, excuse me, because it was just released before the show. Um, the, that third one is uh, the SkyDrive application, the desktop application for Windows 7 and Windows 8 was just updated to support two of the features that people have been basically begging for for months. Uh, one of them is Selective Sync, meaning you can actually now choose which folders on SkyDrive sync to each PC. The reason that's important is that you could have you know 125 gigabytes of stuff up in SkyDrive, but if you have a 128 gigabyte SSD in your computer, there's no way you could sync that much stuff. You just don't have the space. And so now you can go in and say, I only want this stuff to sync to each. And you can do that on a PC by, by PC basis. And so I would say that's probably the number one thing. The second one is the ability to uh, share from uh, the File Explorer interface. And so you could always share from SkyDrive from the web interface, but now you can do it from File Explorer. So that's huge. Um, if you go to skydrive.com, there's a link to the apps down in the left corner, uh, bottom left corner. And you want that it's the desktop app, not the, not the Metro app. And that will give you selective sync and sharing support. So that's huge. Um, the second one is Skype for Windows Phone 8. Um, Microsoft had made some promises around how this was going to integrate into Windows uh, Phone 8. It's not for Windows Phone 7X, only for Windows Phone 8. Um, and they have an open platform now for these types of uh, voice applications. And so Skype, obviously, is the first. It's Microsoft's. But uh, it's available down to preview. It works really, really well. And it gives you that ability to um, basically take over the calling interface. It doesn't actually use the exact same UI, but they... They provide a, a second UI for all of that stuff, you know, the dialer, the voice, you know, um, you know, speakerphone and so forth. And uh, people can call your Skype number and you can answer the, it on your phone. It runs in the background even when the app's not running. Um, Alex, I want to be very clear that you're going to pay for this if that is you doing the Joe B. <laughs> 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 I love how it just keeps appearing. I, I try not to look at myself, but then I see Joe B up there. Um, so anyway, that, it's free. Grab that uh, Windows Phone Store. You can get it from your device. Uh, just go look for Skype and grab that. It's, it's excellent. Um, and the third one, and this is one I, I've been goofing around with my kids about this one because my kids think I'm such a nerd. But um, Angry Birds, to me, in many ways, has run its course. Um, it was a big deal a couple of years ago. And it's like, you know, they release all these sequels, kind of the same stuff over and over again. But there's a new version called Angry Birds Star Wars, which I have to say, I just, I, I love it. I there's something about, I don't, maybe it's just the Star Wars thing. I'm kind of a geek, I guess, but um, it, it's just a fun game and it's really well done. And it, it has elements of the classic Angry Birds games. It's got some of the Angry Birds space stuff, which I didn't play that much of, but you know, the gravity type stuff when you go around the planets, um, there are levels like that. But it also brings in little capabilities from the Star Wars characters. So the little Luke Skywalker bird has like a lightsaber you can use, the Han Solo one fires a gun and you can target that in different ways. And it kind of just opens up the the possibilities, you know, like Obi-Wan Kenobi has like a little force push thing. And um, it, it's, it just takes Angry Birds to kind of a fun new level. And um, it's fairly expensive on Windows 8 and RT for some reason. It's four ninety nine, But if you get it on Windows Phone, it's only $0.99. Cents. And so, especially on Windows Phone, I would have to say um, Angry Birds Star Wars is uh, it's kind of a no-brainer. So it's a cool one. The picks have to be halted because there's a Tony Wang here with a question. He's a <laughs> listener of this show. He has a question. It says, where is my Lumia 920? Yeah, uh, that's he, the same question I have. And he wants uh, it in Tony. yellow. That's why he's having such a difficult yellow time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've never gotten a 920, so um, I share your pain. Nobody nobody knows the sorrows you guys do. I have nothing for him today. <laughs> I feel really bad. It's like I can't help him at all. Well, you know? We'll take that. Am I worthless although, to this man? Although Verizon today is supposed to start getting the uh, HTC 8X as of today yeah, in stores. Well. Uh, although said. I guess the uh, too, pre-orders too are delayed on that. Too beautiful, Tony. Is that too small? Too too perfect in your pocket? It's that too, kind of thing. It's too thin. It's too, too thin. Too it's, thin. Too thin. <laughs> you can't get a handle on the eight X. Uh, that's too bad. You know, I, I I want something that I could potentially use as a weapon against somebody, like a kind of a brick type thing that's in my pocket. Use your surface. That's why we got surfaces. <laughs> you know, you could you could beat people to death with these. I'm pretty sure that was oh, yeah. Microsoft's original uh, strategy. Behind then it the would surface. still work. Yeah. Well, it would. That's to be it would surface. work with the three apps it has. Anyway, let's... Uh, wow. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> Yoing. I was like, I'm going to get hit with something. I, just, I could through Skype. I could feel just it. You're going to get hit by a Lumia 920. Just, <laughs> I would, that just, would kill I, you. I constantly live in fear of that, Paul. It's a constant <laughs> problem I have. Uh, <laughs> shall we move on to the Enterprise Pick of the Week, which I'm sure yes. nothing will be flying at my head. I, no, I won't, throw, I won't throw SharePoint server at your head. Thank Boom. you, Mary Jo. Such a kind birthday girl. <laughs> yeah, so this week it was the uh, SharePoint conference in Las Vegas. 10,000 SharePoint aficionados and SharePointers, they were all there in Las Vegas. And they got 
a very interesting announcement this week. Microsoft is working on some uh, client side compliments to SharePoint that are going to run on Windows Phone 8, Windows 8, and iOS. And this is new. Um, very surprising that they're doing this and very surprising how far along they are too. They are doing two to start. One is going to be a newsfeed app and one is going to be SkyDrive Pro. Um, SkyDrive Pro actually already is available on Windows Phone 8 as part of one of the hubs. I think the Office Hub, it's already in there. Um, but with the newsfeed app for SharePoint, uh, a preview of that is available as of this week for download uh, so that you can try out how you can interact with with uh, SharePoint Server 2013 and SharePoint Online 2013. No, they don't call it 2013. SharePoint Online um, with this app on your Windows Phone 8 device. So that's pretty cool. And they, Microsoft is saying that these are going to be done, or at least the, the first few iterations of these are going to be done as of next year, early next year. Uh, so you're not going to have to wait that long, SharePoint fans, if you want to use SharePoint in conjunction with your new Windows 8, Windows Phone 8 and iOS devices. Do you, do you mind if I ask you a question about that? No. Uh, the SharePoint? I mean, I'm just I curious the answer, but go ahead. Yeah. Well, I'm just curious. So obviously on Windows Phone, there's a built-in integration in the Office Hub. And so mm -hmm. is your understanding of the share, like these apps for Windows, or the app for Windows Phone, is it just a, like a SkyDrive app type thing, but for SharePoint essentially? Is that what it is? Like a SkyDrive Pro? Yeah. Yeah. Like a, it's a separate uh, yeah app for the phone. So uh, yeah, on Windows Phone, SkyDrive Pro is built into the hub, but I don't think the news feed app is. You have to add that in, um, add that okay. onto your phone. Okay. That's not already, already built in. Before we get to our beer pick of the week, I know everyone's waiting for that one. What, what's the code name <laughs> of, the, of the week? Yeah, the code name pick of the week is something I had heard this code name a while ago and I never could confirm what this was. The code name is Triton and Microsoft has used that before uh, way back when they were talking about Neptune and Odyssey for true Windows historians. Um, but the new Triton that uh, we're hearing as a, as a code name is the core CLR for Windows Phone 8. Um, so think about this. What Microsoft's trying to increasingly make the operating system base of Windows Phone and Windows the same. They're sharing more and more APIs. They're sharing the common NT core at this point. And they're also now sharing parts of the CLR, which is the common language runtime, part of the .NET framework. So Triton is this new core CLR that's built into Windows Phone 8. And um, it's, it's just very interesting what Microsoft's doing here that they're... Uh, you know, right now it's not exactly the same core in the two products, Windows Phone and, and Windows 8. But we're, we're seeing like Windows RT, the API on Windows 8. And now we're seeing a subset of that on Windows Phone 8. And I think more and more you're going to see these two platforms. In fact, maybe now that we have some more collaborative people in charge on uh, Windows, supposedly, <laughs> you'll see more and more sharing uh, between those teams on the tool side and the operating system side. So. Listen for uh, mentions of Triton. That's that's the new code name of the week. Yeah, I think definitely, you know, the, having people share things is a good thing, especially beer. Uh, we have a beer pick of the week for the second week in a row. What is the beer pick of the week? I'm super excited <laughs> about this. Yes. So given our whole theme of the show today was Steven Sanofsky and being more collaborative, my beer pick of the week is Collaboration, Not Litigation Ale. That's a real name of a beer. It's from Avery Brewing uh, out in this. Colorado. Yeah, it's, it's really good. It's a uh, Belgian strong dark ale. It's like 8.7%, so not, not a lightweight beer. Um, but it's a, collaborative, a collaboration done between Avery Brewing and Russian River Brewing. So since we're talking about executives being more collaborative, why not have our <laughs> beer brewers also be nice. more collaborative? <laughs> By the way, so I visited this place in Colorado, week. and it is a <laughs> mecca for beer lovers, you must visit this place. Avery is one of the best breweries on earth. It is absolutely amazing. I, I, I had to be pulled almost kicking and screaming to leave this place. Like, I just loved it there. Russian River is quite good. I know it's it's yeah. near here. So, like, if Avery is really good and Russian River is really good, I would like to go and get some beer. I think that's the way to go. So maybe I should wrap up the show real quick so I can go do that. So, Paul, <laughs> uh where yes. can people find you on the internet? Do you, do you write books? Do you do things? Am I on the internet? I guess I am. Uh, winsupersite.com. Actually, we, my site just got refreshed, I guess, or, you know, done over last week. So was it, were that's you aware of cool. this or did it just happen to you? <laughs> no, I was very much aware of it. I woke um, up so one kind day of a, 
Yeah, wow, look at that. My site's different. Uh, no, so I've been struggling for two years with the old uh, CMS we had and the terrible design, and now the site is beautiful, and we have an awesome CMS, and uh, I'm really happy about that. And so um, we have commenting on everything now, so lots of people are kind of engaged in that, and um, we've got a mobile site, which is fantastic, so that's all good news. And I'm on Twitter at, at Therat, my last name, and also... You should check out win, windowsphonebook.com. I'm writing a book about Windows Phone 8, which uh, will be free, and you can download it in progress. Okay, so will it also come with a framed picture of, of Steven Snoddy? Joe Belfiore and everyone else who works at Windows Joe. Phone apparently has no idea that I'm doing this book. So well, that's... <laughs> just so I'm just will it have secret doing it stories in complete as well? isolation. I mean, we've got Windows 8 Secrets is a book available now. Uh, yeah. This book does not d detail any of the internal power struggles, only the, <laughs> no. the other things, the actual use of it. Mary Jo, happy birthday. Uh, where Thank can people you. find you online and uh, everything else you do? So when I'm not at Rattle and Hum, my local brew pub here in uh, New York, <laughs> I'm writing blogs over at All About Microsoft on ZDNet. And uh, what else am I doing? I am not doing another book. I got a lot of questions about that this week saying, hey, now that this new yes. chapter in Microsoft's history has happened, you must write another book. Well, no, Mary jo, I am me not. And you. Me and you. No. no we can do no. it. No way. Listen, no. this time's going to be different. <laughs> no, it's not. I'm not writing any other books, but I am blogging there. Um, I do a column also on Redmond Magazine. I do the back of the book column there, um, all about Microsoft, too. So if you go to redmondmag.com, you can find my monthly column as well. That pretty much does it for us. Uh, I'm Aya Zaktar. I'm available on uh, twit.tv. So if you're watching this network, you know where to find me. So there's my... My, my little slight promotion for myself today. So Windows Weekly every week. Uh, I don't know if we're doing one at Thanksgiving. Is there one from nothing for Thanksgiving? No. So, so you guys no. will be back with Leo in two weeks. The show records 11 o'clock Pacific Standard Time uh, every Thursday, except next week because it's Thanksgiving. You guys, you guys are such lightweights. You can't do a show on Thanksgiving. What is this like? Some <laughs> big holiday or something? Like we, <laughs> you have you have family or something? I, I I don't know anything about that. I'm all about you know making sure that I'm not collaborating with other people at a table about food. That's crazy, right. Paul. But anyway, <laughs> she'll be back. Well, I mean, who knows what's going to happen in two weeks? Maybe the tiles will change from, from rectangular to I don't know circular. Crazy things. <laughs> I think that wraps it up. Thanks again, Paul, Mary, Joe, uh, and you'll see these folks soon. Uh, you guys are free to hang out if you want, but no, I have I'm going to drink to some kill. collaborative beer. You <laughs> kill some terrorists. You have some beer. Happy birthday to Mary Jo Foley. Thank you. Thanks. She is now 20 yes, years birthday. old. She can almost 20 years old and counting. She can yeah. almost drink legally. <laughs>